Welcome in Hokies fans to this edition of the Tech Sideline podcast. We record on Wednesday, September 14th, just ahead of Virginia Tech's matchup with Wofford. In the first half of today's episode, we'll preview the Hokies and the Terriers. And in the second half, we'll jump ahead and take a look at the newly released ACC basketball schedules. All that and more coming up on episode 255 of the Tech Sideline podcast, which starts right now. Right now. We welcome you in, whether you are listening or watching on YouTube. If you are on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe while you're there and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss any future podcasts. want to let you know that Tech Sideline is pre presented by First Bank and Trust Company, one of the nation's leading community banks. First Bank and Trust is a nationally ranked community-focused bank with over 30 locations throughout Virginia and Northeast Tennessee, with additional presence in North Carolina. They offer free checking with industry-leading mobile banking, financing solutions for personal, agriculture, business, commercial, and mortgage needs, and more. Visit www.firstbank.com to learn more. Let's introduce the crew. Today on set, we have Will Stewart, founder and general manager of Tech Sideline across the way. He'll be with us through the first half. To my right, lead analyst and columnist Chris Coleman. In the fourth chair, it's Jake Lyman. Behind the scenes producing is Nick Brown, and I'm your host for today, Katie Adams. A little game we like to call the Mike Young Bowl is mm. this Saturday after 30 years, I think, spent at Wofford. Mike Young traveled on home and came back to Blacksburg. It's worked out pretty well for us Saturday. Should be a fun one, but here's the kicker. It starts at 11 a.m., the earliest game time ever in the history of Virginia Tech football. In the history of Virginia Tech football. You know, sometimes SEC fans have to deal with this. When it's a noon start on the East Coast for an SEC game, it's it's eleven o'clock there. At least if they're you know like one in Texas. state over. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got a, I had college friends who were at the Auburn game when Cadillac Williams tore his knee out in, in college like twenty years ago or whatever. <laughs> and uh, that was a noon game on ESPN East Coast, but it was eleven a.m. there. Wow. It was eleven a.m. at Auburn. So that's right. You do cross the uh, timeline on line. your way to Alabama. Exactly. So. Um, it's 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 not something that happens very often, but uh, since it's Wofford, I I think, and we're all going to be taking a, like a little mental break before yeah. that that thing that happens at eight days <laughs> from now. Yeah. Well, I, I was uh, poking through my our, our garage refrigerator and I discovered an un unopened bottle of a uh, Zing Zang Bloody Mary mix. So I'm good to go, man. I'll get out there early and fire that up. I forgot I had it, so I'm good to go. Yeah, I'm curious what time the tailgates will start, like. 7, 8 a.m. I think it'll be your, you know, like. You're going to be a real hardcore tailgater if you're tailgating for this one. I think. Yeah. But, yeah, I think you feel like you do have to start well, early there are some, that's what you want to do. And that's kind of the way it's it's happening anyway is, like, I, like I got to the Boston College tailgate probably about 3 or 3.30, and there's a certain hardcore group. They're already there. They're set up. Oh, yeah. And then there's a big dead spot in the middle. Then a lot of people kind of arrive, you know, pretty close to the game. I think they'll do the same thing on that Saturday. I think I think people will embrace the uh, the mimosas and yep. uh, Bloody Marys and eggs and stuff like that. I think you'll see people out there at 7, 8 a.m. Then you'll see people getting there maybe at 10 or 1030. We, uh, we, they should just go all night. Start Friday night. There you go. Yeah. You wake up and you're there. That is not allowed where I park. <laughs> I've I think the it gates once. open at 7 a.m. Well, Saturday. I didn't technically do it. Well, I think I went home at like 4 a.m. and then got back up at like 8 a.m. and it was a noon game. Wow. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a wild one. I don't have that kind of energy. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, it'll be an early one. I'm sure the mimosas and the Bloody Marys will be flowing. Got a nice breakfast spread. On the bright yeah. side, you know, if you're still into college game day, I know you said that you don't watch it anymore, but I love college game day, so I'm sure people will be listening to that, watching that at their tailgate, and then it just kind of rolls right into the game. All right, let's get to this matchup. There's a reason why we're only spending one half of the podcast talking about it, and that's because, well, the Terriers have not had a great season. 0-2 on the year have yet to score a point. Chris, is this the worst offense that has ever come to Lane Stadium? I would say yes. Probably, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, at least as far as long as I've been watching. Yeah. You, you can make an argument maybe that that 2004 Florida A&M team it, it they look like a high school team. team. Yeah, they really of, did. Yeah, I was actually on the field for that one, like as for student media. Were you really? So I, I was, was too, because I had done Frank's yeah. uh, fantasy camp that, thing, and I've right. talked about this before. Yeah. And man, they ran out there, and I was like, "Man, oh suit me up! God. I can play for uh, that." Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I don't know that it'll. 
I th- if there's any other team I can think of, uh, it would be the, that Florida A and M team. Yeah. But uh, but I, I, I on the whole, I, I think this is probably. M- you can make a strong, strong argument that it's the worst team Virginia Tech has ever played. Uh, this is a team that's lost 12 games in a row. Uh, they haven't scored the first two games this year. They lost 31 to nothing to Chattanooga and 26 nothing to Elon, or maybe it was the other way around. I don't remember. But uh, I, I want to say last week they only had 128 yards of offense. Something and their, like that. And their longest drive was 22 yards. Yeah. And – now they're facing this Virginia Tech defense. I mean, I don't expect Tech to be like mentally dialed in 100% or everything like that, but this is just a Wofford team that just lacks talent across the board on offense. Well, there's something going on there because, you know, they they have a good history as mm-hmm. a program. They've gone to the FCS playoffs a lot. Um, and so there's something going on with that program. Uh, and Deeper was, than the surface. Yes, know. that's yeah. – It sounds like COVID wrecked them. Yeah, and, um, and there was they a, lost a bunch of employees when, when when they when they shut down for COVID. Like they lost their trainer. And appa- apparently, they shut down longer than most schools. Yes. in that area, and uh, like assistant baseball coaches, maybe even volunteer coaches, were training their football team, and they didn't even get they didn't even get a replacement trainer until recently. Yeah. Apparently, so apparently their whole program was gutted by that whole thing. That whole and, experience, and they just yeah, because this was a team that had made the playoffs four or five years in a row and had made quarterfinals. This was a good program, and then overnight, they just fell off, and it was in 2020. Yeah. Um, there was a post that somebody brought over to, I think it was on our subscriber board, that somebody found on a Wofford message board, and it was a parent of one of the offensive linemen put a big, long post up describing a lot of what Chris just talked about. And it was brought over to our subscriber board and just copied and pasted there. So it's, that, that was our first, it was first like time. They're, they're, they lost an offensive line coach and the running backs coach was moved to offensive line coach or something. And it's like they don't have a real – they don't have like actual coaches at every position or at least they haven't maybe. Yeah. Uh, at least not qualified ones that there are coaches, but they're not necessarily qualified. So I just think, you know, what happened in 2020 just wrecked their program is what it seems like. And they haven't been able to recover. And well, so, so, and because of that, like we can sit here and say, yeah, it's probably the worst team tech has ever played, but, but it's we don't, not we don't, all their fault. It's not, uh, yeah. I mean, I feel bad for them. Yeah. Um, and I, you don't want to beat on it for more than, you know, the first half of this show, because I, you know, cut them their check and hope nobody gets hurt and go two and one and then get ready for the real game next week. And, and Tech's not in the habit of paying a lot for, for buy games these days. I, I don't have the numbers. No idea. But, you know, SEC teams are throwing a million and a million and a half at teams to come into their stadiums, and Tech's not doing that. You're probably talking more 250 k to 350 k That's one of the things Tech does to try to keep costs down. <laughs> and that's part of what leads to – the home and homes with Liberty and the home and homes with ODU is Tech doesn't buy, you know, single games or, or two for ones. So what I'm telling you is Virginia Tech's check is not going to solve their problems, is my is my thinking. Probably not, um, although I expect they will say every little bit will help at this yep. point. But, I, you know, it's – I don't know. You know, I don't know a lot about Wofford football historically, but they've had good runs. So, you know, so I think the, the, I guess the infrastructure is there. They have good facilities because that's where the Panthers have their preseason training camps every year. And one of the things that was said when when Mike Young was hired, you know, everybody looked at Mike Young's record at Wofford and, and, you know, the the negative Nancy's, their line was, oh, he's basically a 500 coach. Well, being a 500 coach at Wofford is, is, is an accomplishment. They're not a well, historically not a well-funded program, so. So through two games, their running backs have averaged 2.1 yards per carry. That's against subpar talent. But it's the best strategy for them just to kind of run the ball and get that clock rolling. They have big running backs. That's about all I can say for their mm-hmm. offense. But, yeah, just keep the uh, keep the ball on the ground, keep the clock rolling, get back to South Carolina with, with no injuries, and your check, I, I think. Uh, it's just uh, – you, you, you can't – Look at their offense and point at a strength and say, "Here's what There's they can no go to." There's no silver lining at all. There's not, absolutely not. They don't have a quarterback. Uh, again, major offensive line problems. Maybe they do have a good running back somewhere, and you just can't see it because everything else is uh, is so limited. That's kind of how you know Pat Garwo was limited last week. I absolutely. Mean, historically, he was a decent a good running, running back. He was a thousand yard back last year. Offensive yeah. line will just kill you. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned their quarterbacks. I read in your preview that is one school that has played more quarterbacks than Virginia Tech as of late, and it's Wofford <laughs> since they started four different ones four, last year. Four different quarterbacks last year. Um, I, I would make a Bears joke, 
but the Packers lost this week, so I'm not going to do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, uh, four different quarterbacks. Maybe they've settled one on, on this year. Uh, Jimmy Warrick started a few games for him last year and the year before. Um, just not very effective, though. Uh, and one of their starting receivers is their former starting punter, and who was also their former starting tight end. So they had to yes. take a tight end slash punter and move to starting receiver. Like I'm just saying, they, they have run out of talent there. Yeah. Was that Parker or Davis that, that used to be the punter? Do you know off the top of your head? Oh, uh, Landon Parker. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of frustrated with my roster card because I'm sitting here looking at it, and you said the running backs were big. So number 21 – Nathan Walker is 6'0", 235. That's good size. And uh, their second leading rusher is 28, Parsons. And for some reason, I, he's not on the roster card. So I can't tell you how big uh, he is. Yeah, you know, actually the guy listed number two on their roster card was out hurt last week. So and it's, so it's not Parsons. Right. But their other guy's about 215, something like that. Yeah. 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 So their offense isn't great. That's not a surprise to many. Do you know the last team that they scored a point on since they haven't scored in the past yes, two games? Yes, I think I do. I believe, and we've talked about this defense as of late and their struggles. I believe it's the University of North Carolina. <laughs> that's, the, that's the last yes. team Wofford scored against was the Dude, UNC defense. Everybody scores on North Carolina. <laughs> and they put, they put up 14 points. It was last year, yep. last game of the year, Wofford lost to UNC 34-14. to 14, so. It was one of their more... You know, it was a respectable game, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah. they've lost 12 games in a row. They only lost to UNC by 20. Of course, UNC's not really trying, but still, like, you you can't let them score two touchdowns on you. They can't yeah. do that against anybody. So I, I think we kind of skimmed over that. They lost the last 10 games of last year. Mm-hmm. I can't remember if you mentioned that or mm-hmm. not. So they lost the last 10, so they're losers of 12 th- in a row. This is a team that was a playoff team, and then 2020 season gets canceled. And so they play a spring season and go, like, 1-4. and four. Right. And then they go one and twelve, and now they're zero and two. Yeah. Uh, so all of a sudden, I mean, they were a playoff team, then COVID, and then can't win again. That is a sad tale. Yeah. Well, this Wofford offense is going to certainly struggle against a very talented defense, as, or Virginia Tech defense, as we saw last week. Brent Pry being a defensive guy, Bud Foster had many goose egg games in his career, so hopefully this is the first of many goose eggs for Brent Pry. I think that this is a game where. You challenge your defense, and you say they haven't scored the first two two weeks of the season. Don't let this be the week they score, especially not in Lane Stadium exactly. of all places. It's, with yeah. the way you've played, because it is there is a natural tendency to you know you play a season opener, then you play a home opener, and now you got West Virginia on a Thursday night. Five days later, there is a natural tendency to mentally relax a little. Plus, bit. it's so, eleven a.m. And plus, it's eleven a.m. So I, I think you, you the, and Foster was good at stuff like this. Like Foster would actually stand in front of the defense and say, "I challenge you to hold them to no points this week." That, mm-hmm. that sounds like something he would do. So uh, I think that that's what I would the direction I would go in if I were Brent Pry. I mean, it, it's really hard to. It's probably hard to get your team to take Wofford seriously from a from a mental preparation standpoint and everything like that. So I think you you got to look at them and set set a goal for them and right. say, here's our goal at the end of the game for Wofford to have zero points. Is it accurate? I think I saw this that the last shutout Virginia Tech had was a Bud Foster Bud Foster coached that, defense. That's, sure, that's right. That was, yes, uh, they shut out Georgia Tech and Pitt in back to back games in 2019. Right. But it's been since 2019 that Virginia Tech right. hasn't pitched a shutout. So right. Well, they had a pretty bad defense in 2020, and yeah, 2021 they didn't get one either. I think the looming question is: This game a letdown if Virginia Tech gives up any points at all? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It depends. It's like the third string defense that gives it up, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, I gotta say, the law of averages, Wofford's supposed to score. They're going to score right? at some point. Uh, you know, I was I was thinking about picking them to score a field goal this week, and then I looked up their kicker, and uh, he's new as far as being the field goal kicker. So he hasn't attempted a field goal in a college game yet. And he's been their kickoff guy, but only three of his 67 kickoffs have gone for touchbacks, so he doesn't have much of a leg. So, weak leg, first time kicking in a college game. So I went ahead and picked the shutout. All right. Um, David picked uh, picked Wofford to score three. I picked a shutout. Um, <laughs> D- David's the negative one. So one, one of the, one We'll of confront the, him about this on set when he joins us in the second half. One of the parallels that's being drawn is uh, Tech beat uh, Akron 77-27 to 27 back in, in 1995. Um, and somebody on the message board said, well, Tech got up 77 nothing, and then they put in the backups, and, and Akron scored 27 points. And I looked it up. Tech actually got up 56 to nothing early third quarter. 
that that game was pretty insane. And and Akron's a better program now. They were pretty bad back then. They almost beat us the next year. Remember the Jason yeah, Taylor game? Yeah, in '96, in, right? In the, in the in the hurricane or the tropical depression at that yeah. point. And, um, and and Walter Ford dropping, yeah, yeah. dropping punts, dropping punts all over the place. Um, that's right. But uh, Akron, you must stress, has probably had. Probably, and then Akron was bad in 1995, don't get me wrong, but Akron probably had 10 to 20 times the amount of talent that this Wofford, yeah, Wofford team yeah. has. But, you know, Bud, Bud put in all his backups and got really mad at him when they gave up uh, three or four scores. Mm-hmm. So, so we'll see what happens in this one. So the defense is definitely not of worry this week. I'm kind of looking for this team to have some fun. Armani Chapman's so close to a pick six last week. Or maybe a scoop and score, mm-hmm. something of that nature. I would hope that we would walk away with a defensive touchdown on some front. I, I think it's certainly possible that the defense outscores Wofford this week. That's true. Um, it might only take one defensive touchdown to do it. It's So this is one of those things where, um, I mean, I, I played football as a kid. I didn't even really play at the high school level. Um, but... Uh, as, as I look back on that, one of my flaws as a football player, I wasn't mean enough. And this is one of those things where when you're Virginia Tech, you go out there and, and you know un, unless it's it's the apocalypse is coming that you're going to win. So you got to, like you said, you got to set goals for the defense in particular. Got to set them for the offense too. And you just got to go out there and be mean and, and feel sorry for those guys later. You know, that's yeah. the way football is. I was saying earlier, you know, football, that's not their bread and butter, of course, and it was previously basketball. Do you feel a little bit bad that we took Mike Young away from them? And- <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's worked out well for us, so it's And Hunter yeah. Couture and, and Storm Murphy and uh, yeah. Kevin Giltner. I'm yeah. sure all of them will be on the field pregame, and Mike Young will be reunited with his former AD. It'll it'll be a joyous occasion. I know his son goes to Walford, too. I think he's a current sophomore mm. at Walford, so... That'll be fun. More to get to ahead of this game on Saturday, but let's throw it over to Jake in the fourth chair. Well, you guys talked a lot about the defense, and if they play the way they did on Saturday against Boston College, you can assume that Wofford's probably not going to move the ball very much. And the leader of that was Taiwan Garbett. Uh, Last week on Tech Talk Live, Brent Pry said that it would take a lot for someone to take the lunch pail away from Chamari Connor, but it seems like Garbett did enough on Saturday to do that. Yeah, and I got to say that's well-deserved. Um, you know, like Chamari Connor, like mm-hmm. Dax Holyfield, this is his sixth year in the program. And he's a guy who he's been always been a very consistent player for Virginia Tech. He, he's never been a guy who you're like one year he's down here and the next year he's up here. He's just been a steady, solid guy his entire career. I think he's probably had more consistent coaching at defensive line. Because I do think Tech has had defensive line coaches, good, excuse me, good defensive line coaches, even when they've changed coaches. They've remained strong there, uh, unlike some of the other positions on defense. Uh, but yeah, I think I think that's that was the best game of his career, and he just kept going and going and going. And he's playing hurt too, apparently, according to, to Pry. I don't think it's serious, um, but yeah, I think you have to give it to him after a game like that, don't you? Well, and it, it looked like he's still embracing his dog who hasn't eaten in three days mentality <laughs> in the picture that they posted with him holding the lunch pail that looked like there was yeah. a little dog chain on it, too. No, so. uh, yes, it was. It was uh, <laughs> that was great. Yeah, you don't want to go up against that guy. I'm, I'm nervous for whoever on Walford has to deal with him <laughs> yeah. this week. So looking at the our photos from the game, we have two photographers on the field this year, which is pretty cool. Nice. Because we can put them at each end and whatever happens. Like the photographer who was at the uh, end where Armani Chapman made the interception got some great pictures, yeah. you know, and, and vice versa. Um, and so we, we wound up with like 200 photos after the game and going through them. It's like Garbett harassing Jerkovic, Garbett harassing Jerkovic, Garbett hitting Jerkovic, Jar- Garbett hitting, just Garbett over and over and <laughs> over. Yeah, I don't know if we've ever had a set of photos <clears throat> where it's been so about one guy from, from yeah. one game. That was pretty impressive. If I were Wofford, I think I would run a bunch of draws aimed kind of towards off tackle because I do think the Virginia Tech defensive ends if I was a Virginia Tech defensive end I would be like hey CJ McCray I bet I have more sacks than you this week <laughs> you know I'm still no, I'm serious this is this is a week where defenders like that they would be trying they're going to be trying to pad their own stats so there might be a little bit of of undisciplined play so if, you, if you're Wofford you maybe try to take advantage of that with some screens and draws and things like that yeah. if there's any kind of if I was a Wofford coach and I was coming up with a game plan I think that's the only thing so I you're come saying up with. there's a chance <laughs> <laughs> 
So we know what the defense is capable mm-hmm. of. Really, this game is more about the offense, and it kind of poses as a great opportunity for them to maybe try some new things, work on some old things that didn't work, and gain confidence ahead of the West Virginia game this week. Mm-hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. You don't have to game plan to beat Wofford. Right. Um, you know, th- and it doesn't matter whether it's 31 to nothing or 60 to nothing. Now, that said, their defense is better than their, their offense. Their defense is better than their offense. It's, it's average, yeah. but it's better. Uh, anything's better than their offense. Well, with the offense scoring zero points, the defense has only given up 57 <laughs> right, in two games. Right, Yes, mm-hmm. they exa- haven't exactly had a lot of help. Um, but I, I think if you're Virginia Tech offensively, you know, you put on the film of those last two weeks and you figure out what you did well and what you didn't do so well. And you practice what you didn't do well. Those types of plays, those types of formations. And, and you really uh, get it across to your players that we're working on this this week. We have... This is our last week to get it down before the schedule heats yeah. up and the real games start. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's objective number one for Virginia Tech. This, this isn't about whether you cover the spread against Wofford or however many points you score against Wofford. It's about using this game to put yourself in as good a chance as possible of beating West Virginia next Thursday. And, and I think if, if it were me, I think the I think the big thing they need to work on is the running game, run blocking specifically. The timing, of, yeah, the timing of the blocks and everything. I mean, we, we went over the, the numbers on Monday's podcast uh, with the uh, the blocking grades and everything like that. But, you know, there's five or six players at tight end on the offensive line who have played pretty good football for Tech in the past, and they're nowhere near that level this right. year. And if it was just one guy, it would be one thing. But the fact that it's everybody shows that as a group collectively, they're not picking up this offense very well. Not yet. Not yet. It doesn't mean they won't. But this is a great, great opportunity for them to go out there and and focus on just the offense itself without having to worry about a game plan right. or at least an ex- extensive game plan for the opposition. And then they, the flip side argument to that is uh, they haven't been passing down the field very well. So mm-hmm. do you try to throw some down the field? So it'll be interesting to see – what they focus on. Who knows? You may see all of it. If, if they start having some success, they may do everything. But um, I also think, and I don't think we've talked about this in any of our articles, um, you got to figure with West Virginia coming to town next Thursday, it's a short week. Mm-hmm. It's not uh, a bye week before you, you host days. it. Yeah. You got to figure there's some, at least on the coaches' side, there's some looking at West Virginia I, game film that's going on and scheming for no that. No question. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think you got to. I think you play the percentages of the fo- as a football coach. Can one or two extra days of preparation against West Virginia be the difference when you're playing Wofford, a team that is O for their last twelve? Yeah. And yeah, it, it can be. But you know, West Virginia is going to be doing the same thing. Uh, who do they play? I, f- I forget who Towson. we said they play. Towson. Thank you, Nick. Uh, they're playing. Towson's not as bad as as Wofford, of course. At least I assume they're not. But it's still it's still a game that West Virginia can probably do the same thing to a certain extent but the, the but the short the short turnover games generally favor the home team because absolutely there's that that one travel day wvu involved. loses a day to travel that's right yeah. well assuming that this is a game where you can kind of up the score and give younger guys some reps who do you want to see specifically that may not be poised for a big impact this year but potentially has a bright future uh, that's a good question. What do you think, Chris? You, you, you've got Is the it Bryce roster. Duke? Uh, well, you know, for me, it's of course Bryce it's Duke. Bryce Duke. <laughs> I'm surprised it took you that long to answer. Uh, well, Chance Black also. He's, he's shown flashes here and there. He's gotten some play in time. Um, I would say every single offensive backup offensive lineman. Well, you know, a guy we talked about last week who uh, I don't know if he even, still hasn't played as far as I know, Braylon Moore. Uh, the, yeah, I'm, the, well, I'm thinking Christian Moss, too. He got yeah. six snaps last week. Did he? He okay. did. He did. Um, Jalen Jones, I don't think got any, but Christian Moss did. So, yes, that's certainly another one. Um, defensively, see if they throw a guy like uh, Monsoor Delane in mm-hmm. there because mm-hmm. um, uh, this would be a good opportunity. And I remember you've still got four games to play, guys. Or, or freshman. Freshman. Yeah. you got four games, and they can still redshirt. And Tech has played three freshmen for two games. So, Burgos, Bryce Duke. And Harrison St. Germain. And Harrison St. Germain. Uh, so those guys can play in two more games and still preserve their red shirt. Right. Um, well, it'll be interesting to see. Like, I'm a little surprised we haven't seen Braylon Moore already because he was a guy Pry said before the season was going to contribute in game one, and then he didn't. And then he didn't contribute in game two either. Well, he's Jesse Hansen's backup, right? Correct. And Jesse's having a good year. He's having a good year from a pass-blocking standpoint. Yes. <laughs> Most of the Virginia Tech linemen are having a good year from a pass blocking standpoint, but none of them are having a good year from a run blocking standpoint. Still, you want you want there to be rotation in there, and 
we unless he's hurt, we will see Braylon Moore this week. Yeah. Um, so was the question specifically about offense or just the whole team? Offense and defense. Who do you want to see? They're, they're where rotating those so many guys on uh, D. So, some of those young defensive ends that they seem to be pretty high on. Yeah. Uh, Kyrie Moyston, Burgess w- w- would be another one I would like to see. I think maybe Kelly like Lawson. Cam Johnson at cornerback yeah, too. Yeah, for yeah sure. I was thinking about him too. <laughs> yeah, and I would expect this would be the game to put him in. Uh, and Kelly, Kelly uh, Lawson for me. Is, is definitely one. Just a really long athletic guy at linebacker. He's listed at two spots on the linebacker depth chart. And I'll be honest, I think he's too young to learn two positions. Like, I think it's – he only moved to linebacker in the spring. And if you're practicing – and he's been hurt too. So, if he's actually practicing at Sam and Will, I think that's maybe a little too much for him. Right. I, I think that she should learn one now and then another one later. But, you know, whatever. Uh I'm anxious to see him on the field and whether he'd be playing Will or Sam when he gets out there. I would assume Sam, but I don't know that for a fact. I just had a random thought. It wouldn't surprise me if Keyshawn Artis was a leading tackler in this game. <laughs> He's a He's phenomenal a game, run yeah. defender, um, great tackler. And they're um, going to run the ball a lot? He's he's a guy that they might put him in early and leave him in for a while. I didn't realize he played so much against BC last week. He had over twenty snaps against BC. Is he, is he still wearing number fifteen? Let me see. I think yeah, he's wearing. He is. Yeah, still wearing number fifteen. Or did he? Right. Who wore twenty five last week? Did our artist Nyquie Hawkins wore? No, that was not, game one. That was game one. Yeah. Um, artist. Yeah. Was yeah. Artist, so artist wore twenty five. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Is like who's number twenty five? Oh yeah, it's him. Yeah. So one thing that we haven't mentioned for the crowd that was so ready to uh, bench Grant Wells after game one, you would assume that we would see Jason Brown in this game, maybe the entire second half. I would think so. I would think so. And maybe even you get Devin Farrell like the last possession of the yeah. game or something like that. I hope they play but, him but, too. But I'm, people always talk about playing the third string quarterback, but uh, it's important to get Brown a lot of reps in this game. And the game. third stringers don't even really practice the offense, right? Once the, the season starts, depend, aren't they scout d- team? It depends on the coaches. Uh I would th- I would think for Tech, uh, Tech would have two guys to run the scout team. I mean, Tech would have Taj Bullock and then the walk-on to run the scout team. They don't need a third quarterback. So he's getting some reps. He's he's get, uh, he's hanging around uh, w- with a group of guys that are getting ready for, for the game. But, you know, if something happen- were ha- to happen to Grant Wells, you want Jason Brown to ha- get, have some game sharpness in him. So, yeah, get him out there. But at the same time, in that last what we all assume will be meaningless possession of the game, I'd like to see Devin Farrell in there and mm-hmm. and let him throw the football. Right. Don't hand it off three three or four straight plays. See, now you got me intrigued. I'm I'm wondering how much yeah. how much they'll balance the the Brown Farrell thing if I, they I, get well, a significant lead and take well. The thing out. about Brown is, you know, if he plays lo- enough snaps, you know, you can take him out for that last possession. He's a senior. Like it's right. not like one extra possession against the worst FCS team in the country is going to. Affect change his trajectory his trajectory yeah. exactly so uh so i don't think that's big a deal uh, that big a deal but so it wouldn't shock me if we saw Farrell. one of david's keys to the game was avoid injury which is huge because these games are not are not worth losing anyone over you think about last year losing james mitchell in the game against mm. middle of tennessee uh, which completely kind of i think impacted the trajectory of our season ginormously after you know he yeah. tore his acl but speaking of injury, there's been a lot of nagging nagging ones. What's the expectation for, you know, Keyshawn King, Caleb Smith for how much they're going to play? King just didn't seem all that hurt to me. Like, when you go back and watch it, he jogged to the tent. He was smiling on the bike. He was smiling on the sideline in the second half. Uh, I, I don't I don't think he's – it just doesn't seem to be that bad to me. Um, that said, you don't need him. You don't need him. Uh you, know, you you do want him to stay in a rhythm to a certain extent. If he's healthy enough to play and he's not in pain, you know, there, there's some injuries that, that, like, it might take a little while for the, the pain to go away, but you don't run any risk of re-injury. Uh, I might play him for a quarter. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, hopefully the game's over by then and you call it a day. Um, Just no Malachi Thomas. Don't want to no, see him. No Malachi no. Thomas. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> not till you know, just wait. If, if if they so play we, Malachi Thomas this weekend and he he re-injures himself, man, this Chris, podcast Chris is going to be, be ugly yeah. next week. <laughs> I would think that this coaching staff would be smarter than to play, even if he's begging to play. Just like one yeah. more week and then the keys are yours. Yeah. Yeah, and as so. for Caleb Smith, I don't know. You know, um, you could tell I, he was not. Ha- hamstrings are tricky. Now, Caleb Smith, and I want him to get 
he seems like he's very important. We knew he was going to be an important player for Tech this year, but I believe he's their highest grading player on offense through two games. Yet he's only played, what, 40 snaps, 50 yeah. snaps? He's played fewer than half of Virginia Tech's snaps. But what has he done on those 50 snaps? I mean, he's caught six passes, the two, you know, two big plays on offense. That, that was a hell of a catch. Like, they didn't oh. call interference. Or but, a face mask. Well, there was a holding and a face mask. And he still caught it with on. one hand. That was right. amazing. Yeah. Um, it should have been the catch of the week. But I, I – Again, you want to work on the sharpness of the passing game, the timing of the passing game, and everything like that. You also want your best receiver, your most productive receiver, is what it seems like he is, to be healthy after this week. So I don't know. I don't know how you play that. Hamstring injuries can be tricky. Like it's, they're maybe the hardest injury to figure out. I think uh, sometimes you're over them in a week, and sometimes the, you know, they can be one of those nagging injuries that lasts all year. It's, it's difficult if there is a particular motion that aggravates it. It's difficult in the heat of a game to not execute that motion. Yeah. You know, and. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. When you're pushing off as a wide receiver on your back foot, you're going to feel it in your hamstring every time. And maybe that's the thing about Keyshawn King is, yeah, he can jog up and down the sideline, no problem. But if you put him in a game and he's got to make lateral movements and he's got to, so who knows? We don't know what his injury him. was. Yeah. Uh, we, we're pretty certain Smith has a hamstring, right? That's it, that it's a hamstring. I don't know. Um, I, I, I thought it was. Maybe yeah, I'm well, you, you guys I have are... No, I have no idea about uh, about Keyshawn King, though. Somebody said they heard it was a hip pointer. Yeah. But I really don't know. Yeah, and that's one of those things that can linger. But well, Before we close the page on Wofford, Hokies should win this one convincingly, but any final thoughts? Oh, my gosh. Just I, I, don't I, get hurt. Well, I do have a thought about the injury thing. Okay. I, have a, I have a theory, and you know, people that play the game at a higher level, it'd be interesting to see if they agree or disagree. I think when you take a team lightly and you don't play as hard and you're not as dialed in, you may be more likely to hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. I think if you're playing full throttle, um, you're probably positioning yourself. Like when you make a tackle, you're using proper technique and all that kind of stuff. I wonder if you're actually more like, I know a lot of injuries are just random. Some of them are non-contact. Some of them are a guy falls on your leg or whatever. But I just wonder if in a game like this where where if you do dial it back a little bit, you're actually more likely to get hurt. That's a good question. Now, I will say I don't think Tech has had a ton of injuries this year. It's just the injuries they have had happen to be very important players on the same side of the ball. Right. They're all key offensive players. Yeah. Uh, the, the defense is, is healthy. Um, you know, I guess Garbutt's been a little bit banged up, but still healthy enough to play and play well. Uh, so it's kind of unfortunate for, from that standpoint. But hopefully Tech can get healthy here soon once they hit the stretch run. Yeah. On to game picks. We'll run through this quickly. Will and David now 1-1. One and one. Chris is at 0-2. Oh at no surprise, the whole crew's got the Hokies in this one. Only difference is, like you said, David puts the Terriers on the board with his score. He can defend that when he's on set during the second half. Will, you've got Tech 37 to nothing. Chris 41 to nothing. David 34 to 3. And then, by no surprise, the fans also are picking Tech to win by what, eleven plus. What what percent has him at eleven plus? I do not know. Jake, can you? It should be a hundred. <laughs> it should be a hundred I mean, unless some Wofford fan. I think race. people probably cl a couple people clicked Wofford to win just to see and be just, funny just, or something. Yeah, but. probably so. All right, I'm There's just scrolling one down. I'm scrolling down to find the uh, find the poll. But I feel like I might have been a little conservative. Yeah, and I picked it with a bigger margin. I would hope that margin. they would win like 70 to 30. So it, like, it's, they could. Miami I know they, beating Bethune Cookman. I know they could if ago, they wanted but. to. But. It's 94%. Nine, um, wow. Okay. 3% are picking the Hokies to win by 1 to 10. And then there's 3% that are picking Wofford to win. I, that so. 1 to 3 just does not grasp how bad Wofford is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's not the same playing field as. ODU and Liberty, yet this we can't make that joke because is, we lost ODU. This, so. Right, and this is not nowhere close to ODU. Yeah. This is that no, is an odd choice. This, is, this isn't even close to 98 Temple. I mean, this is probably the worst football team Virginia Tech has ever played. Yeah. Well, that's 28 votes out of 1,023, so maybe they just clicked the wrong circle. It's possible. <laughs> As we know, don't mess with the Sun Belt, but this is not a Sun Belt team. Right. They're worse than that. Um, that'll wrap up the first half preview of the Hokies matchup with Wofford. But before we break, let's check back in with Jake in the fourth chair. Well, first off on that fan poll, uh, 23 votes for to win by 11 plus only eight for the Terriers to win by one to 10. So eight, 
More people seem to think that if the Terriers win, they're going to win big. They're, those people are either, <laughs> either joking or, the, or they're Virginia Tech fans that have just been burned one too many times. It's a margin of error in those yeah. polls. You know, a lot of people don't take them seriously. Well, most fans seem to think that Tech's going to win big. So I wanted to look back and see some of the highest scoring games in Virginia Tech history because there's always a chance when you play an FCS team, especially a bad FCS team, that you could put a lot of points on the board. I was surprised to see... And obviously a much smaller sample size of FCS games than FBS games. But only four of the top ten highest scoring games in Virginia Tech history are against FCS schools. uh, Two of which have now become FBS schools, Mm -hmm. App State and Arkansas State. Oh, that App State game was like 66 to 10 or something like that. Yes, I looked up that score recently this week because I knew that we had played App State with my mom going there. And it ended up being a blowout. I don't think that would happen in today's day and age, but apparently back then App State was not good. Was yes. That, was that the year App State beat Michigan? No. No. It was this was like 2012. 2011. Oh, 2011, yeah. And 11. it was 07, I think, when they beat Michigan. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, App State is actually the second most points that Tech has ever scored, 66. And you guys already mentioned the That's Akron wild. game, 77 mm-hmm. points back in 1995. Yeah. Uh, the only two teams that Tech has scored 60 on that are still in the FCS – William and Mary back in 2018 and the Florida A&M game you guys talked about too mm-hmm. that you said might be the most comparable uh, opponent to Wofford. So we'll see. Maybe uh, Tech adds a fifth FCS team that they've hung 60 on this weekend. And and don't laugh. You never know because here are those here's the points that Virginia Tech scored in that 1995 season before they hung 77 on Akron. They scored 14-0, 13-26, 14-0. There was no indication that they were about to go out and score 77 points, which is what they did the very next game. Yeah, that was the last Virginia Tech team to get shut out in a game, actually. That is correct. And, uh, and then a couple weeks later, they were only beating Navy 7 to nothing at the end of the third quarter. So the first half of the season, Virginia Tech was not a dominant offense that year, and then they played Akron. And then they scored 45 in the next game against Rutgers. Right. So. so, yeah, they caught on fire just like that. That's, That's when it. they figured things out. That, again, that, that was a team that had some key injuries early. You remember uh, Oxendine was out. Um, uh, was Marcus Parker out? I don't think he was out. But, oh, but, uh, it was 1996, uh, the year that they had to play Chiron Stith, who was right. a true freshman. That was the next year. Yeah, uh, Brian Still was out Wow. early. Yeah, yeah. so they had, they had some critical injuries to key players, kind of like this year. So yeah. hopefully this offense at some point wakes up like that offense so, did once so people get healthy. Were you in sixth grade in 1995? I was seventh grade. Seventh grade, man. See, that's why Chris is awesome. He started paying attention to football when he was like 11 or 12 years old, 10 years old maybe in 1993. So he's got he's young, but he's got this vast storehouse of over that, 30 yeah. All years. All this knowledge stored up. Yeah, yeah. And I, but I, I can't remember last week. Too it much. must be kind of hilarious to sit us sit here and listen to us talk about stuff that happened in 1995 in detail. And right, it, when it, I just simply wasn't alive. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Well, like you said earlier, Akron's still one of the worst teams in college football, and they get to travel to Knoxville, Tennessee this weekend and have fun with Hendon Hooker's offense. So that'll that was a, that, that Tennessee pit game last week was really good. Speaking yeah. of Hendon Hooker, somebody said Hendon didn't play all that well. He, he didn't start out right. well. Yeah. Um, you know, Pitt got out. Pitt jumped out to a ten nothing lead. I think they yeah. lost their quarterback. I want to say. Yeah, I think he. Yeah, is like his. yeah. Keaton, I think is how he pronounced it. There was some yeah. bad bad luck with injured quarterbacks th- this past week for that's certain true. teams. Quinn Ewers. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, that uh, that's going to lead us into our break here on episode 255 of the Tech Sideline Podcast. In the first half, we talked all things Hokies and Terriers, and in the second half, we're going to jump forward and take a look at the Virginia Tech basketball schedule basketball tips off in just under two months make sure you stay with us we'll be right back
welcome you back into episode 255 of the Tech Sideline podcast brought to you by First Bank and Trust. As a reminder, if you're watching on YouTube, continue to drop any questions you have for David and Chris in the comments, and we'll get to those with Jake at the end of the show. First off, welcome to the set, David Cunningham. As much as I love talking about this matchup with Walford, I can't help but get excited for what's to come with basketball season. Yesterday, the men's ACC basketball slate was released around 2 p.m. and the women's hot off the press this morning at 10 a.m. Taking a look at this schedule, you open up the season against none other than the North Carolina Tar Heels. As we know from March Madness, this UNC team can get hot. So the fact that we get them early and only once this year is really good. Yeah, I think it's interesting because if you remember, each year now that the uh, the ACC scheduling model has gone up to 20, you play 20 games, 10 at home, 10 away. Well, they always throw one of those in early December. Two years ago was Duke. Last year was Wake Forest. And Tech had a really bad showing. Oh, yeah. Um, but but tech also wasn't really tested because we thought the non-conference schedule was going to be more difficult than it was. <laughs> um, this North Carolina team is going to be really good. Uh, they made it all the way to the national championship game last year and lost. Um, and, and that's just kind of like the tip of the iceberg. Um, I'm really excited about this schedule um, because you get you get North Carolina once and you get them early and then you don't see them again until maybe the ACC tournament. Yeah. Um, and that that it's kind of a early season test for you um it kind of stinks that you don't get them later in the season because if you know you want to be playing your best basketball as the season rolls along um but but i i think to start with north carolina um and you get them at home too i think that's the big thing yeah uh, tech played north carolina at home in their first game in the acc ever yeah i was a senior at tech and how did that one go oh tech got up 10 to 9 and we're all hell yeah tech's in the acc <laughs> woohoo and then carolina won by like 30 and uh it was not pretty but tech still went eight eight and eight in the acc that year somehow and had a, had a pretty good year um yeah i think that's that's pretty intriguing um i yeah. think that er, there's an early season stretch obviously um with the Charleston Classic, yeah. you know, you'll play some teams down there, and then you come back and you got Minnesota and in, then, the, in the ACC Big Ten Challenge. Then, then you've got North Carolina. Then you've got Dayton. Then you've got Oklahoma State. So there's this big run of games in, in November, which in, and excuse me, uh, November into December, December, yeah. which include a conference game, and, the, and they're all intriguing. Yeah, I think last year that Wake Forest game was kind of like in the middle of a, of a bunch of smaller games and you've mm -hmm. got the big 10 ACC big 10 challenge North Carolina Dayton Oklahoma State this comes after you just spent five or six days in Charleston so uh that that's a game where it, it's it'll obviously be tech's most difficult opponent you know but until it gets into deep in the ACC maybe all season depending maybe. on you know this is a depending on how good actually this North Carolina team is I mean Armando Baycott returns so you know all of them RJ Davis yeah. Caleb Blow everybody except for Brady Man everybody except for Brady Manick right, right. Yeah. That's right. so this is going to this is going to be a really challenging North Carolina team but the fact that tech you hope is not walking in there you know without being tested before yeah. and last year's Wake Forest game I think kind of caught tech by surprise Wake Forest had a ton of transfers that hadn't played in the ACC before. The last time we played Wake Forest, they hammered them twice. I mean, just hammered them. Yeah. So you just remember Wake Forest, and you're like, oh, we killed them twice last year. And then Tech themselves hadn't been challenged last year. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Wake comes in. You don't think it's going to be a challenge, and then it and then is. And Wake blew them out. I don't, yeah. I don't think between the name and between what North Carolina did last year and what North Carolina bring back, I, I don't expect Tech to overlook it. And I also think... Tech will be much more challenged leading up to that game. Speaking of the North Carolina game, I think this could also be a spot where maybe they unveil like the Virginia Tech ACC champions banner in front of North Carolina's face. Oh, that would be Davis. great. Be I mean, that I think it, it would be better to do it then than on Monday, then against Delaware November State. 7th yeah. against Delaware State. Yeah. Well, I think it is important to note that that season opener against Delaware State, I, I assume it's going to be a doubleheader because the women have a game that mm -hmm. day too. Yeah. So my guess is they'll unveil both tournament nta tournament banners right but i would, yeah, as, I would as, save the ACC as, I would one save, for, you, for you you, mean, you need to make some phone calls yeah. and talk, talk to mike young and say hey yeah. you should save that for I saw sunday him in, December I, I saw him in kroger the other day if i see him in kroger again i'll be sure to mention it there you go unc obviously wishes that they won that game but i think they were just more glad that we ended up beating duke and, and well and Coach they beat up, they ended up beating <laughs> they ended up beating duke anyway yeah yeah exactly yeah. 
Um, well, looking at the schedule, when this comes out every year, the first thing that I look at is where are the winter break matchups? Who are we playing? Um, mm-hmm. They're actually pretty favorable this year. A lot of those matchups while students are gone are on the road, first of all. And then your two home games, you get Clemson and NC State. So it's not UVA and it's not anyone from Tobacco Road, which worked out in our favor. Yeah, well, if you remember a couple of years ago, um, there was one season where Tech played Duke and Virginia. They hosted them when oh, the students oh, were yeah. gone. Both of them. Yeah. A- and it was kind of like that trend for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. I think one of them was the Grayson Allen game. I believe you. Um, where Grayson yeah. didn't play because mm-hmm. of the tripping incident. But mm-hmm. but last year's schedule was was pretty good over winter break. And, and then this year, too, like you said, Clemson, NC State. And when the students come back, they come back and they get Duke. Big the, Monday. That's the, that's the first home game after winter break is Big Monday the following yep. week. Then you get Syracuse. They've got Virginia the following week. There are a lot of home games on Saturdays, which I know the the non students, the other other crowd likes, which, mm-hmm. which is nice because you can bring your family in for the weekend or something like that. But um, but yeah, the fact that you know NC State and Clemson, they'll be okay. I mean, you know, they're lower level ACC teams, more towards the the bottom of the conference. Um, and Tech plays at Boston College and at Wake Forest, so. It's kind of like that that stretch. You're not really missing out on much, which I know Castle Guard and the students appreciate. You're you're never gonna see me count Boston College out of a basketball game against Virginia Tech, <laughs> yeah. especially especially in Massachusetts. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. I know they're not ACC, and I'd forgotten we were even playing them until they beat us in football. But we play Old Dominion the first game in the Charleston Classic. We do. Yeah. yeah. And I really I want to go to the Charleston Classic. Yes. Yeah, we're playing. I've always wanted to go to Charleston. Yeah. I've Who knows been. when we'll play in that tournament again? We're playing Liberty that week. Yeah. Which, and the the tournament starts on Thursday. It's and Thursday, we get, Friday, Sunday. Right. So I could still watch the the Liberty football game. game. On, you, on Saturday. You, you can sit back and watch basketball all weekend. Besides Saturday, reserved for football. Yeah, I should probably do that. Yeah. yeah, speaking of the Charleston Classic, I'm looking forward to it because I think that Tech has a really good chance to win it. And like y'all said, we play at Liberty that weekend. So I know I will not be going to the Liberty game and I will be going to Charleston nice. because I'm excited and I think they have a good chance to win. But David, is there a, looking at the schedule, is there a stretch where maybe the Hokies have a good chance to stack some wins or a stretch where it could get really difficult? Well, I think that for the beginning of, of January, like that, that first little stretch between North after North Carolina and before Duke, Virginia, um, you, at, you got Boston College, Wake Forest, both on the road, Syracuse on the road, and Clemson and NC State. So that's, those are five winnable games that could go either way, but, but Tech, you would think, would be the favorite in all of them. Yeah. Then you get into your at Virginia Duke at home, and and that's kind of the stretch where I would be worried for Virginia Tech, potentially. At Virginia, at Clemson, Duke at home, Syracuse at home, at Miami, Virginia again. That's pretty much all in 20 to 20, 25 days. That that three-game road stretch, and then you come back and play Duke. Yeah. And and overall, you know, it's uh, four out of six, I think, on the the road. Um, That's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we sit here and we spend so much time uh, break. Oh, man. And you close your at Duke. I was going yeah, to add. And then home against Florida. It, State. Don't count out that Miami game at home. Because either. it'll be a rematch yeah, from my, the half court shot. Miami obviously invested a lot of money into their basketball program this last season. <laughs> uh, legally now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but that, that final stretch of Miami at home at Duke at Louisville and then Florida State like that yeah, is. That's a dagger there. But but if you look at. The in between, you know, there's the four game stretch where it's Boston College at Notre Dame at Georgia Tech Pitt. Those are four winnable games. So, mm-hmm. so I think it, it kind of teeter totters. I think back, it, back and forth. Like, okay, this is a stretch where Virginia Tech could do really well, and then this is a stretch where it's going to be kind of, you're just gonna. It's like, oh, great! You get through a game, boom, turn around. Here's another big opponent you have to play. That's so. you know, and that's ACC. Yeah, right. And look, Virginia Tech has been good enough in basketball for a while now, a, long enough to the point where other fan bases are sitting here breaking down their ACC schedule, saying, "Oh, we got three tough games in a row. We, we got Virginia Tech in there in the middle yeah. of these two other teams, right? I mean, this is a good program now. Yeah. Uh, so we shouldn't be we shouldn't be afraid of anybody or back down from anybody." Uh, I think, and obviously, we sat in the off season last year trying to break down last season's schedule, 
and we said it was such a challenging non-conference ge- schedule, and the Tech was going to have a chance to probably have two or three uh, quad one wins by yeah. the time conference play started, right? Well, it didn't turn out to be a good non-conference schedule, and Tech uh, didn't have any quad one wins. Yeah. So, you, you know, you, it always seems like things are going to be a certain way before the season start, and then and then it's not. So I wonder which one of those teams that, that we just talked about set, and we're saying, oh, well, it's th- this be a is good kind game. of an easier stretch. Who's going to tank? And then the season starts, yeah. and you're like, wow, that's actually a tough game, and this team who we thought was going to be good. Yeah, well, you remember, remember you know, Tech went to Florida State last year. Right. That always would have been a quadrant one game. Until then. And, yeah. and that was the game where Virginia Tech started their upward trajectory, and yeah. Florida State just completely collapsed. Yeah. I think there are a lot of those games, and back when um, the ACC had deci- announced, kind of decided that they were going to renew like the scheduling matrix kind of thing, like the the system. So we we knew who Tech's opponents were going to be, but we didn't know the dates. Obviously, um, I went went and looked, and I think Tech will end up if if you took what last season's teams were and put it with this season's schedule, Tech would have like. Three, maybe three or four more on on paper quadrant one games than they would have last year because you get Duke at home, you get North Carolina at home. Those are two games. Now, obviously, we don't know how good UVA is going to be, but you get Miami at home, you get Miami on the road, you get Duke on the road. So there are, there are obviously chances, but it obviously yeah. just depends on how the ACC shapes out. You need wins and you need the computer numbers to match up. Yeah, and uh, so you obviously want to find that that balance. Uh, if if you're one of those teams, now people are going to ask this question every year: how many te- how many games do the Hokies need to win to make the entire tournament? And the answer is every year. I have no idea. Some years as it might be as 19, humanly some, possible. Right? Yeah. I mean, it depends on what the rest of the uh, what the bubble looks like and yeah. whether I mean Tech might not even be a bubble team. Maybe maybe they'll win 24 games and and they're in no matter what yeah. at that point. Um, so. You know, we're going to be there or thereabouts. I think the, the yeah, I think season. it really just depends on the state of the ACC, right? We spent so much time talking about in the spring. Like, the ACC did not get any credit. And then Duke and North Carolina both go to the Final Four. Yes. And Miami made the Elite Eight. Mm-hmm. And, and it, nobody had, give, nobody had just, given the ACC credit all season because when they had go, played in these these non-conference tournaments... They were, they were bad. My, everybody was bad. Yeah. Remember Miami? We were bad. Miami, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, Tech wasn't great either. But but the ACC just as a whole got was so undervalued because of what happened in the non-conference. And they got hot at the end of and the then year. They, you know, they basically hit each other and kept punching each other back and forth in the ACC schedule. And then it's like, okay, well, how good actually is the ACC? Virginia Tech almost didn't get in. They, they won their way in. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden you get to the NCAA tournament and, yes, Virginia Tech didn't beat Texas, but they played a pretty good Texas team. Mm-hmm. And North Carolina, Duke, Miami, I, there, there were a Final list of teams, teams that yeah. all went to the Elite Eight or Final Four, and it's like, okay, maybe the ACC can play. So don't judge the, a book by its cover. Yeah, uh, but, you know, that that's just something that you're going to have to deal with because, like it or not, they start counting games at the beginning of the season. Yeah. So North Carolina, you go out there and get smoked by Tennessee by 15 or 20 points in December. That counts, right? That counts towards the conference. It's great, unfortunately. Virginia yeah. Tech goes out there and loses to Dayton. That counts. So if you want to be seated higher, you need to play well all season. We'd obviously seen the non-conference schedule before yesterday, but David, you uh, posted in your article yesterday that there's such a long stretch before this team actually has a true road game. Yeah, it's well, it's not until that Boston College game in, in late December. December 21st. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe that's by design. Oh, my I, God. I, I can't, that, that, that's going to be horrible. I can't imagine it's or, by design, right? No, like, no, nobody goes to Boston College games anyway. Like, <laughs> and now you're talking about well, four days before Christmas I'm when the students are on break, I'm, and Virginia Tech's got to go up there and play in front of 500 I, I was people. Say, yeah. I'm, I'm glad Will's not here because Will will go on his Boston College rant. Oh, but my like, God. Yeah, it, it, I do think it has its it has its plus and minuses, right? Positive yeah. and negatives. Like, Virginia Tech does not play a true road game until that Boston College game. They play 11 non-conference games, and four of them are at neutral sites. Three in Charleston, one in Brooklyn uh, against Oklahoma State. But all those other games are at home. Okay, it's great. You get Dayton and Minnesota at home. You even get North Carolina at home. But going on the road is a completely different animal. Whether yeah. it is, even if, whether it's going across the state to Virginia or whether it's go flying all the way up to Boston, like 
Tech did not play well when it went up to Boston last year and lost. So mm-hmm. that is a sneaky, you know, Boston College. I expect Boston College to be better this year. Uh, they return all five starters, I think. Um, I, I don't expect Boston College to be one of the top teams in the ACC, but if that's your first road game, you haven't been on the road yet, that's a sneaky game. It's sneaky. I mean, man, nobody's going to be there. And so at this point, uh, Virginia Tech's going to be mid-January before they play their first road game in front of a hostile environment, if you think about it. Yeah. So like half their season is going to be done before they ever have to face that atmosphere. And then they have to do it three games in a row. At Syracuse, at Virginia, at Clemson, yeah. which should all be pretty good atmospheres. Yeah. Well, I, for one, cannot wait to see how the reigning ACC champions do this season. Before we switch over to women's, let's throw it back over to Jake in the fourth chair. Well, you mentioned the reigning ACC champions, Virginia Tech. Uh, there has not been a repeat ACC champion since 2011 when Duke finished up a three-peat. But I wanted to look back and see how recent ACC champions have fared the next season. Uh, and they've done pretty well, actually. Out of the last six ACC tournament champions. Two have won the national championship the following year. Uh, have, but have they, don't get me excited. Jake. But, but wait, two, out of the last six, two, two of them the have six. won. Two of them have won the national championship, yep. but none have won the ACC tournament. None again. of them have won the ACC tournament the next year, but two of them went on a run. Vir- what tournament. Virginia? That's, that's, I've, I've been maintaining the last couple of years. Virginia Tech can win a national championship in basketball. It's about getting hot at the right Stop. time. You're making me too I excited. Know, so don't even say it. I, I'll let you know who it is. <laughs> so one's Virginia. Virginia, yes, uh, they won the ACC uh, in 2018. Won the national championship 2019. UNC did the same in 2016. Then won the national championship over Gonzaga in 2017. Oh that was a that was forever ago. Yeah, yeah. long time ago. Yeah, Virginia uh, Tech can get hot and beat and beat Notre Dame and UNC and Duke back to back to back. You can do it in the national. Th- th- there are easier roads no. to get to a na- uh, to a it, national championship than an ACC tournament yeah, championship. Yeah. Sometimes, it, it, and that's why everybody wants to. Uh, everybody always asks the questions. Do you think the Hokies can make the Sweet Sixteen this year, or, or the second round, or whatever round? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, you got to see on the, the draw. Match- yeah, it depends on the yeah. matchup. Right. Like, like I would say, last year. Virginia Tech men's basketball got a tough draw with Texas. They One did. of the best defensive yeah. teams yeah. in the right. country. Right. Even though we had that video of the Texas player's eyes shooting oh, out of his hilarious. head when he saw he had to play Virginia Tech. <laughs> yeah. What well, do you know? We lose. It, it, you know, it was it was strength against strength, right? Yeah. Texas Tech's really good offense against Texas is really good defense. Oh, Luma and Couture got in foul trouble. Yeah, I mean it, it was it was foul trouble. Half. Tech played it. Texas played it. Tech. Texas played a very physical game, and you know I think. That's a completely different ball game if if it's a team with two offense with you know both teams have offensive firepower and Virginia Tech's defense, as we talked about all season long, had continued to get better. Mm-hmm. And I think if you play against a lot of other teams that that offense is maybe as good as Tech's, well, I think Tech might have a better chance to win a lot of those games because Tech's defense was better. Sure. So it comes down to the draw. Yeah. Well, and four of the last five ACC champions, this is in six years because obviously Duke, who won in 2020, didn't get a chance, or yeah. who won in 2019, didn't get a chance to play in the tournament in 2020. Uh, but four of the last five that have played a full season have reached the Sweet 16. The only exception is Georgia Tech last year, who did not have oh, a Oh, well, very that, good makes season. Sense. Yeah, uh, that makes but, sense. Yeah, yeah. So, so, every, so high, high anybody hopes. with a pulse. Yes, right. any any team with a pulse that won the <laughs> ACC championship the year before <laughs> made it to the Sweet 16. All right, so where are the Sweet 16 sites next year? That sounds like another good trip. <laughs> Do you want me to look? Uh, I've looked at them like at some point. Jake you, Jake, you look them up. And I'll you, look them up. You tell Greensboro, us when we, Greensboro's a Sweet 16 Yeah, Greensboro is a Sweet 16 spot. I'll let Jake look them up. Yeah, um... But yeah, like you said, all that stuff's kind of a crapshoot postseason stuff. But those are interesting numbers, though. Like, I mean, I think Tech's going to be back in the NCAA tournament this year. Yeah. Oh, I would expect. Uh, I, mean, I, I think Tech might be better than last year. Please. Team. I think they're a deeper team than they were last year, and they oh, have yeah. they have more lineup versatility yeah. within their players. Uh, he went out there and played the same eight guys all of last year, no matter what. Mike right. Young sat and in this he, chair and told us there yeah, was going to be more versatility. Exactly. Yeah. I Doesn't think, mean they'll win the ACC. No, because I think, and I think part of that was Tech got hot at the right time. Correct. And, but they, and, they might not be hot that weekend this year, of course. Yeah. Uh, but I think they're more Kate, more likely to win a game in the NCAA tournament this year. I agree. Than, than last year's team. Sweet 16 sites this year. The East is New York, Madison Square Garden. So oh, wow. Nah, that, that's the closest Ooh. one. Uh, actually, that's not true. Let's uh, go south. The KFC Yum Center. Uh, Ooh, Louisville. 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 Well, we um, don't win there, so let's hope point. not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other two, Midwest is in Kansas City, and then the West Regional is in Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Uh, not sure how excited I am TSL about TSL Vegas these, trip? Oof. I could get down with Vegas, yeah. 
But there are a lot of good first round uh, areas that that we're kind of close to Greensboro, like Nick mentioned. Uh, Columbus, Ohio is not too far. I've been to uh, Yeah, I've I've watched Tech play in the NCAA tournament in Columbus. In Tech, Orlando, won. they did win a game. Orlando Ooh. would be nice. Yeah. Uh, so far, I vote Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Hopefully, uh, maybe Tech can become the third team in the last decade to win the ACC tournament one year and then turn yeah. that into a national championship. I got I got to stop us before we get too excited <laughs> about this when we have not played a game yet. Now, this Hokies women's basketball team has the potential to be one of the best that we've really ever seen. I want to touch on their schedule a little bit and show them some love because they really deserve it. Um, unlike the men, they open up on the road against Boston College um, ACC-wise and then their home opener is against Notre Dame, which we've had a lot of really great games against Notre Dame in the past. I know personally I'm very excited for that because my cousin, my cousin just became a member of the Notre Dame women's basketball staff, so excited to That's see cool. her. Yeah. What's what's her role? She's the SID. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, well, and of course, that Boston College game on, on the road, uh, it is the same week. It is the Wednesday after Virginia Tech opens up against North Carolina. Because that same day, tech tech men are playing North Carolina. The women are at Tennessee. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's tough. It, Let's get out of that day two and zero, oh, please. That'd be yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah I you know this women's basketball schedule. Nebraska is the uh, the ACC Big Ten challenge opponent. I, I think it could be more challenging, but I think it's it's winnable. And how often does Virginia Tech play Nebra- play a Nebraska team in a lot of things anymore? So that's cool. Yeah, they get to go to the Bahamas. Um, which I saw that. Go. Cool places. I'm very, Evan Hughes, I'm very jealous about Evan Hughes. Yeah, yeah. Um, <sighs> that jerk. But but, <laughs> but but this ACC schedule, it's it's got its ups and downs. Kind of like the men's. Um, you know that early January schedule, New Year's Day. You got North Carolina mm-hmm. at home. That's great. You get Virginia, a, a team that is rebuilding, new head coach, at home. Great. But then you got to go to Miami and play Louisville. Miami made it all the way to the ACC Women's Basketball tournament championship last year so are those games over winter break the unc these, and uva ones yes that's unfortunate so it worked out for the men it worked but the out winter for the break men, schedule, not, not so the much women. the women yeah and then that louisville games at home too before the students get back mm-hmm. so that's three Dang. tough games on the women's yeah. side that, that they'll be missing the students um but and then there's then there's a stretch um where tech has nc state florida state Duke, NC State, North Carolina, and Georgia Tech. That's wow. the end of the season. Last six games. Mm-hmm. You so, would hope that they're playing their best basketball at that point, so it's yeah. it's a dagger, but also hopefully they're in mid state form. Well, if you remember last year, Tech was playing really good basketball, and then Kayla King got injured, right. then Elizabeth yeah. Kitley got injured. Which and- actually, playing that UNC game in the ACC tournament and winning that game with those players hurt makes that game even more all the more yeah. incredible. Mm-hmm. It's on, honestly crazy. But yeah, the Tech's last six games, all in February, that's you know play, getting NC State twice, um, North Carolina once, Florida State once, Duke once, and ending the season on the road at Georgia Tech, who is not a pushover. Um, it, it is going to be a challenging schedule. But I also think that this women's basketball team has a chance to be like the preseason ACC favorite. I mean, yeah. especially with the transfers. Two All Americans, right. Taylor Soul, All ACC player, Georgia Amor's an All ACC player, Kayla King's an All ACC player. I mean, this team is going to be really good. Yeah. And they were, even if they hadn't added a single transfer, they still had a core of really good players coming yeah. back. Mm-hmm. And then they add arguably the two biggest impact transfers in the league. Yeah. So, like, you're going to have really good players coming off the bench. That's the thing. Where do you put Kiana Trailer? You know, like, she kind of had that six-man role last year, but when injuries, you know, injuries killed Tech a little bit, um, she came in and stepped in, and she had a huge tournament. She was, like, first or second team um, all-ACC tournament. She's gonna, probably going to be coming off the bench again this year because Tech's starting five is so good. So I, I'm very excited. I think the women are going to be maybe the best team in the conference. Obviously, NC State's going to be really, really good. And Tech gets an NC State twice, and I believe the home game is on a Sunday. Um, yeah. So that matches up well. Tech fans, like I think February 19th. Um, and, and I think there's a there's a men's game around there at some point. Um, I've been trying to pair the schedules up, but yeah, um, but yeah, that, the women's schedule is going to be very interesting. Like you mentioned with NC State, looking at the women's schedule, that's where my eyes went first. Is when does this team play NC State? And the fact that you play them 
twice and they're relatively close together can be a good thing and a bad thing. If you drop the first game, get back in the film room, you, you play them again several days later and kind of work on those things, or they beat them twice. Is Elisa Kunain is back? She, I no, she, she's gone. I don't, I believe. Yeah. She left. Yeah. I think she got drafted. Okay. She got drafted. I think um, I like our chances more than I liked them with her. Yeah. So. Oh, that's no question. Yeah, she got yeah. what? Who she, did she go to? Uh, Seattle storm. Seattle. Oh yeah. That's Seattle right. storm. Um, she did she not did make not, the roster. Yeah, she got cut. Oh. Um, yeah, I, I think this. I, I think one of the biggest things is Louisville, Notre Dame, Miami, Duke. You know, there are gonna there are some teams that are that are pro that are really really good or have fallen off a little bit over the years, but are still kind of up there. Virginia Tech is so good that I think I think it's Virginia Tech. No. Notre Dame or not Notre Dame, NC State and uh, North Carolina, those kind of top three teams in the ACC. I expect the Tar Heels to be really good, but um, I'm very interested to see. You've got a like you said, Tech women have a solid core. How do the transfers complement everything? And, yeah, you get you got to get. I mean, it's going to be a new system for them. Like everything has to mesh together. Yeah. Like the talents there. No question about the talent. You just got to make sure. I think probably Kenny Brooks' biggest job in the preseason is to is to make sure it meshes well together. Yeah. The, the the new players that they brought in who are really good mesh well with the really good players that are returning. I and think if they, if they do that, then they're going to win a lot of games. I, I think it's going to be tough for Kenny to keep a lot of guys, on, a lot of people off the court. Honestly, yeah. like that sounds got, like a great problem. You got, I mean, it is a great problem now. You got some like you got some talented freshmen that are you know that are here. Um, I think in general, the nice thing is there's so much depth that the young players get to red shirt if they need Ooh. um as i know does he know where the button Put is the light on i don't okay. know next week and it got it yeah <laughs> um so the fact that they'll probably some of them will might have a chance to red shirt or you know my guess is they'll they'll have learning opportunities they can learn from the older players i mean the fact that elizabeth kitley um Elizabeth Kitley and Kayla King and Georgia Amore that trio that has stuck together for so long is back and now they've got really really good players around them still you know i think kenny brooks since he's got to virginia tech has continued to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade and asia shepherd was great but now you bring in another all american and how like that that doesn't really happen you put two all americans together because you got one essentially out of free agency like mm -hmm. Kenny does such a good job on the recruiting trail. Putting it together is kind of like this final piece. Good players like to play with good players. Yeah, so they want to win, and and you play with somebody really good. It's gonna it's gonna open things up for you. Yeah, to a certain extent. Um. So yeah, I, I think Kenny's put himself in a pretty good position this year. The depth is great, like you said. I love talking about basketball. We're about two months shy from doing that on a weekly basis, so I cannot wait. 50. Let's go ahead and take a couple questions from the chat, Jake. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a few questions. Uh, all of them are football related. First off, Chris, I know you always say that the Temple upset in 1998 is the largest of all time. Ryan wants to know if everything went wrong on Saturday and Tech fell to Wofford, would that surpass oh that? Uh, <laughs> yes, it would. Because we if, would never recover if, as a if, football program. If, if, no, we wouldn't, and we wouldn't have any <laughs> business recovering if we did something like that. Like I don't think it's physically possible for Wofford to win the game. Like it would have to be something like Tech could probably put its walk-ons in and win. I just yeah, I mean, and I don't say this to make fun of Wofford, but I, their program was trashed in 2020 with COVID, and they yeah. have not recovered. And they've lost 12 in a row, and most of those games hadn't been close at all. Uh, I mean, I just, I don't, I can't see a scenario where it would happen. I just. I'm it's not like, nothing. It's like, it's like 99.9 percent .9 Virginia Tech. More than that. <laughs> more, <laughs> more. Yeah. Uh, you guys talked about some of the younger players that were going to get involved. We've had people in the chat asking about Devin Farrell, who you said might get mm. in late in the game. Bryce Duke. Uh, I don't think we mentioned what, who Bubba Fisk wants to know about Daquan Wright. Do we think he could get some oh. work on? Saturday? I I think he could. Um, and I think. He's a guy that could help in the passing game and with an explosive play ability. Uh, now, he's a guy who I, I would envision that they would use in a, in a role similar to Connor Blumrick. So there might not be necessarily a lot of snaps to go, to go around for him if he were to play this year. Um, but again, you don't have to make that decision right now. You know, you can play him this week. 
see how he develops uh, as the season goes on. Because as we know, like Malachi Thomas, he only played in one of the first five games or so last year, and then they threw him out there against Notre Dame, and then All boom, of a sudden he's playing he's the rest of the season. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, think it, I guess it just took him a while to probably learn pass blocking like, like for a lot of running backs. Um, so you, sometimes you see yeah, a freshman will come on after the first month, and then they'll play him because they're still constantly evaluating these guys in practice every day. But, yeah, Daquan Wright would be a guy I would certainly be interested in seeing. Two, two guys I actually asked – cornerback Armani Chapman about it um, a little bit ago when I spoke with him on Zoom. I asked him about Mansoor Delane and mm. uh, and uh, Cam Johnson, yeah. and he said both of those guys are, are dogs, and, mm. you know, essentially the biggest thing is learning the playbook for them and kind of getting their feet right in the system. Mm. But I think those are two guys, Brent Pry and Chris Marv and kind of the defensive guys as a whole. They were all kind of high on both those guys. He said Mansoor Delane might have played, you know, leading up to the Old Dominion game. He was talking about Mansoor Delane playing, I think. And I saw him running off the field after a play. I swear he played in that game. Yeah. It might have been like the first play of the game, like the opening kickoff or something. He was running off the field to the sideline. But anyway. Yeah. Well, I think those are two guys that you're playing a team like Wofford. Those are two guys that you can get game experience and they're ready to play. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and you don't have to play them after that if you don't feel the need to. Like, I'm positive Cam Johnson's going to redshirt this year. If they don't redshirt him, they're crazy. I mean, he's not in the too deep at cornerback, and he's too small to really help you on yeah. special teams. I think he's a really talented, natural player who came from a great program. But he's, he's got to get bigger. Yeah, I, I think this is a it's an opportunity, though, for a guy like him to get his feet wet, play 20-something snaps, they can look. They've got film for him to, to work on his stuff, and then he can spend kind of the rest of the season in the weight room. Yeah, and both those guys are Maryland guys. Yeah, and Tech has always had good luck, not not luck per se, but they've always had good defensive backs from Maryland. If you think about it, uh, they're bringing in another one next year from Dematha, uh, Dante Lovett, who had a pick six uh, in Dematha's thirty-eight to nothing win over one of the better teams in the state of Virginia this past week. So uh, I always like signing DeMatha guys because they're generally well-coached, well-prepared. They're ready to play early. Cam Phillips, for example. I think that's all we've got today. All right, well, before we get out of here, game previews posted on Tech Sideline. Go read Will Stewart's take if you want to get a chuckle out of that. Oh, it's brilliant, <laughs> detailed, in-depth. One, one of his better pieces of work on TSL.com. <laughs> uh, David Cunningham posted a basketball schedule recap. Tomorrow is Tech Talk Live, so we'll have notes coming out about that. Anything else I'm missing? Yeah, Chris Hirons will have a story on the women's basketball schedule today. Great. Sometime today, maybe tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Chris Hirons will have something on that, kind of getting him back into the flow of things. Um, it's nice that uh, Chris and I were talking about it earlier this week when I found out that the the schedules were dropping. I was like, thank goodness. He, Chris was like, thank goodness it's this it's week when there's yes. nothing to do. Absolutely perfect. Oh, they could have been Wofford big jerks and, and brought him out next week. That would have been horrible. Yeah, I don't. Oh my God, I, yeah. I don't think. Um, I'll, I'm. We today's Wednesday. We get to observe practice. Talk to Brent Pry after practice. Um, so depending on if there's anything interesting, I will likely have a story. Um, after that, um, we'll get to talk to, I think, J.C. Price on Thursday. Um, besides that, nothing crazy interesting. I mean, it's Wofford. It's it's one of those weeks where Virginia Tech just takes a moment and it's like you got to focus on yourself a little bit. So, some me time. Have a nice oh, yeah. post-game tailgate and go watch some 3.30 football. Exactly. We're nice done Saturday. by 2.30, so settle in and, and watch some football. We didn't spend as much time talking about the women's schedule, like you said, so go read Chris Hiron's article. Another great episode of the Tech Sideline Podcast. I want to thank everybody on set today. Will Stewart, founder and general manager of TechSideline.com. He was on the first half. You can follow him at Will Stewart TSL. Chris Coleman, lead analyst and columnist for Tech Sideline. You can follow him at Chris Coleman TSL. David Cunningham, a VT Twitter favorite. I'm sure all of you <laughs> already follow him on Twitter, but if you don't, he's at the real Decunna. Jake Lyman back again in the fourth chair. Enjoyed your contributions today, getting me a little too excited about the possibilities of Virginia Tech basketball That's winning a national scary. championship. <laughs> Nick Brown producing <laughs> wonderful as always. Hookies take the field for game three against Walford at 11 a.m. in Lane Stadium on Saturday. Former Hokie great Eddie Royal is on the call alongside Wes Durham on the ACC Network. We'll be back Monday morning to break it all down. I'm Katie Adams signing off from all of us at Tech Sideline. Enjoy the game, Hokies fans, and enjoy your weekend. Sweet.